Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Distinguished Professor Series, Lecture Series 2021, The Concept of Being Human in the Age of Digital Technology of Institute of Senior Christian Studies. My name is Hong Liang, and I am Assistant Professor of China Graduate School of Theology and the Special Researcher of Institute of Senior Christian Studies. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to be the moderator for, of for today's lecture by Professor Gregor Eisenmüller, the embodied image of God, the doctrine of hu being human being in theological perspective. In recent years, as some of you will know, the Institute of uh, Sino Christian Studies has increasingly focused on interdisciplinary research and initiated from 2017 to 2021, five research projects, Dignity, Morality and Rights 2017, Risk and Hope, 2018, Trust, 2019, Hospitality and Autonomy, 2020, and Body and Bodyliness, 2021. In connection with the current research project, the Body and Bodyliness, we have invited three eminent professors to present their research on anthropological issues in the age of digital technology, with the hope that this sheet light on these complex issues and help us to think about the meaning of being human in the age of digital technology. It is a privilege for me to introduce Professor Gregor Ezermüller, our speaker today. Professor Ezermüller is one of the leading theologians of the present. After receiving his doctorate in 2000 and his habilitation in 2008 at the University of Heidelberg, has been professor of systematic theology at the University of Osnabrück since 2016. His main research interests are 19th and 20th century dogmatics, ecumenical theology and liturgical science, interdisciplinary anthropology and ethics. Professor Ezra Mueller's theology is characterized by his expertise in the Greek tradition of German philosophical theology, German idealism, biblical theology, and interdisciplinary studies with a sensibility for the current problems. In recent years, he has focused on the interdisciplinary anthropology. From 2013 to 2017, he was the principal investigator and sub-project leader of the Marsilius Project Embodiment as a paradigm of an evolutionary cultural anthropology. The research resort was first published in English in 2016 with the title Embodiment in Evolution and Culture. Then in German in 2017, Verkörperung eine neue interdisziplinäre Anthropologie. His new monograph on anthropology, as far as I know, will be published soon. I should not forget to mention that our scholars of the current research project, the Body and Bodyliness, six Chinese university professors of different specialties will join us today. We are very much looking forward to today's lecture and the discussion. At the end of the lecture, about 50 minutes, we will facilitate a time of question and answer, about 30 minutes. Please feel free to raise questions if you are interested in this lecture. Just click the Q&A button and type your questions in English or Chinese, better in English. As the moderator, I was predestined to raise the first question to open the Q&A session. Professor Azamillo, the floor is yours. It's embodied image of God, the anthropology of embodiment in theological perspective. Every assertion about God is simultaneously an assertion about humanity and vice versa. Rudolf Bultmann arrived at this programmatic statement in interpreting the theology of Paul, which signaled to him an inseparable bond between theology and anthropology. Whoever speaks about God also speaks about the human person. For that reason, reflection about the human person is part of theology from the very beginning. John Calvin wrote, 
the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves are bound together by a mutual tie. By contrast, the theological discipline described under the name theological anthropology only emerges in the 20th century. This new theological discipline seeks from its beginning the dialogue with modern anthropology. That is what distinguishes theological anthropology from the classic dogmatic locus de homine on humanity, that part of the doctrine of creation in which theologians have traditionally discussed their view of the human person strictly within the bounds of their own discipline. Theological anthropology seeks a dialogue with the sciences and the humanities. Theological anthropology helps critique basic anthropological assumptions in church, academia, and civil society, supporting a more realistic understanding of the human person in these three arenas and resulting in better practical guidance. And therefore, now my first point, theological prologue, now godlessness of humanity. It is a privilege of theologians to speak about the human person in a way that no other academic area does. The task of theologians is to reflect on the God, the message that in Jesus Christ, God has taken on human nature, human flesh, and that hence, in my bodily existence, I belong to Jesus Christ. Those who have heard and understood this message, and who in fact has ever heard and understood it fully, can live in confidence and take heart in dying. The gospel has been summarized as a comfort that I belong, body and soul, in life and death, not to myself, but to my savior, Jesus Christ. The theological reflection on humanity begins with the gospel. From a theological perspective, the true and hence the real human person is the person as brought to light by the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The content of the gospel is Jesus Christ as a person in his history that is the Christ event in which God reveals God's self as God for us as caring for this world and its salvation. Theological anthropology understands the human person based on this event, on Jesus Christ. If you are facing the true human being in Jesus Christ, that human person who is brought to light by the gospel then we should not shy away from saying that the human person, first of all, is a being in whom God delights. Jesus' life, lived in close communion with God, takes place under God's declaration, you are my son, the beloved, with you I'm well pleased. In the same way, we can look at every human person with the assumption that he or she is a son or daughter of God, and that God is pleased with them. If we ask what justification theologians have to include everybody into the Christological statement from the text about Jesus' baptism, we can first refer to the way Jesus himself taught his disciples to pray the Our Father. In doing so, he regarded them as similar to him. They are privileged to call God their father and consider themselves sons and daughters of God. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. The disciples are allowed to call father, whom Jesus calls his father. In the gospel of John, Jesus speaks explicitly about my father 
and your father. Through Jesus Christ, we are sons and daughters of God like Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John spells out the reason for the equality between Christ and the rest of humanity, which redounds to our salvation. And the world, the Logos, became flesh. God's world enters a sphere that had not been associated with God previously, the flesh. Regardless of the view that God had a body, widespread in Judaism and Christianity in antiquity, the Bible never attributes flesh to God. It is only in the incarnate one that God's world and flesh join together. In Jesus Christ, faith recognizes God's presence in human flesh, e.g. in humanity, and so in Christ's own bodily existence. Since flesh unites all human beings, even human beings and animals, humanity and fleshly nature can no longer be thought of as a godless after the incarnation. Humanity and fleshly nature can no longer be thought of as godless after the incarnation. For that reason, the Gospel of John calls Christ the true light which enlightens everyone who comes into the world. As the one who comes from God, Christ brings God's glory into the human world. From then onwards, God's glory can no longer be sought of appropriately apart from the grace with which God cares for the world. The Pauline and Dario Pauline traditions encapsulate this insight in calling Jesus Christ the image of God or the image of the invisible God. According to this tradition, in Jesus Christ, the invisible God, even God's whole fullness, is present in the world. Once that is believed and seen, the history of humanity can no longer be interpreted as godless. Since Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, reflects God's glory, introducing it into the world, human persons find themselves as part of a story that is permitted by God's glory and which aims at God's glory entering into everything. Christ does not view his status as the image of God as an exclusive possession, but lets his own and ultimately all people participate in it, even all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. God's glory is mean to shine not only in Jesus' life, but also in the lives of all believers, even in the lives of all people. I have to interrupt for a moment because I often get the message that my uh, internet connection is not very stable today. Um, I want to ask, uh, can you follow me? Is it good in yeah, picture? Very good. And... Yeah, very good. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Then I will continue. Once more, you can read it at the PowerPoint presentation. God's glory is meant to shine not only in Jesus' life, but also in the lives of all believers, even in the lives of all people. Jesus Christ's glory, e.g. God's saving grace, presents the human person in the right light. The human person is viewed theologically, not primarily a sinner, but a person in whom God is well pleased and whose face reflects this pleasure. As the splendor of Christ's light is reflected in the human face, the human person is always already justified and sanctified. In this sense, we can say evangelical theology, in the sense of a theology appropriate to the euangelion, to the gospel, understands the human person on the basis of the fact 
that changes everything. That in Jesus Christ, God has lived as a human person among human persons. In Jesus Christ, the ace of faith see God's presence in our fleshly all to human story. And so in everyone's story. The gospel localizes us human beings in a story that is not godless, devoid of the divine, but replete with salvation. Those understanding humanity on the basis of the gospel see human persons enmeshed in a story of deliverance in which they emerge as those they were meant to be from the very beginning as persons in whose life God's grace is powerfully at work. My argument is in life with Karl Barth's anthropology. Barth opened his anthropology with a characteristic remark, in Jesus Christ, we not only see who and what God is in Jesus Christ, we also see who and what the human person is. Barth's anthropology was published in 1948. Three years after the end of World War II in Europe, but saw more clearly than many others what happened in the previous years. He had the mass murder of the Jews at the concentration camps clearly in mind. Yet Bart disputes that these events show the essence of humanity. No, war and mass murder do not reveal the essence of humanity, rather they obscure it. It is not sin that discloses who the human person is, but the incarnate world of God. For this reason, Bart makes a suggestion. Quote, let us assume for a moment that we can say who and what humanity is, also only in relation to this person, e.g. Jesus Christ. What is the result in terms of the distinctive characteristics of humanity among other creatures? Pursuing this guiding question, but identifies two aspects that characterize the distinctiveness of humanity. In the human person named Jesus Christ, we come to know God. Quote, it would be impossible to see and think about the human person, e.g. the person named Jesus Christ, if we did not at once see and think about God also. Second point, God's presence in the life of one person is not an ambivalent one, however, but the presence of the Savior. The God who is present in Jesus Christ is a savior of humanity, the eternal and almighty, the total and unique savior. His presence is the presence of the saving God. While a theological anthropology must preserve the distinction between Christ and the rest of humanity, it cannot develop this distinction in such a way as to contradict the anthropological insights we have gained from the discussion of Jesus Christ. For that reason, Bart assumes, if it is true for the human person, for the human person Jesus, that in his humanity, we are confronted immediately and directly as a being of God, then necessarily assuming that there's a similarity between Jesus and us, in spite of all dissimilarity, Every human person is to be understood as belonging to God, e.g. in the light of God, and above all, God must be seen as actively moving towards the human nature. End of quote. But then for starts, a possible misunderstanding of the thesis, which would emphasize that humanity belongs to God, but deny the salvific character of that fact. Starting with the premise 
that God's presence in Christ is a history of the deliverance of each and every man, but argues that every person exists as part of a history which stands in a clear and recognizable relationship to the divine deliverance enacted in the man, Jesus. If in theology we speak of the human person, we speak of a being in whose history God is present as savior. And there was, I come to my second chapter, the human person as a psychosomatic unity, the wisdom of the body. In the incarnate Christ, the Christian faith does not only acknowledge the presence of God in the sphere of the human flesh. In the incarnate Christ, the Christian faith sees the embodied nature of the whole person, and at the same time, the wisdom, the competence, and the power of the living body. The traditions about the Son of God becoming a human person make plain that on the one hand, the human person is flesh, in Greek, sags. The Gospel of John understands the fact that God becomes human as God's becoming flesh, and the word, the logos, became flesh. This way, John contradicts any kind of anthropological dualism. The entire person is flesh, even reason, even the mind is embodied. On the other hand, the incarnation implies the theological dignity of the living body. The American New Testament scholar, Luke Timothy Johnson writes, the human body not only can reveal God, it is a privileged medium of the divine self-disclosure. The physical, fleshly body is nothing we would have to be ashamed of as a view to God, or which we even had to reject. To the contrary, it is destined to be the site of God's revelation. That is true not only for Jesus Christ and the church as his body, but also for the individual bodies of believers. In spite of all danger to the flesh, this applies also to the mortal flesh. According to Paul, it can and will become the place of Christ's epiphany. That's very interesting. If you read Paul, it's not only Zoma, the lived body, but even Zark, the flesh, which can and will become the place of Christ's epiphany. Since the New Testament understands the body as a privileged medium of God's self revelation, it emphasizes the fleshly, ugly nature of all human life in continuity with the Old Testament. Nevertheless, for centuries and up to the present, Christianity and its theologies have supported and refined dualistic views of the human person. From patristic times up to the present, hostility to the body has been unshakable in theology. Moreover, for the sake of intellectual honesty, Protestant theology has adopted the modern Cartesian dualism. By consequence, theologians have focused on the disembodied subject, which was then envisioned as immediate to God. At the same time, theological anthropology has lost those factors from view that connect the human person with the world, both the body objectified in the third person perspective and the lived body perceived in the first person perspective and experienced as oneself. In German, we make the difference between körper and life. Körper is the body objectified in the third person perspective. And life is a body 
perceived in the first person perspective as my own body and experience as oneself. Against this backdrop, the current interdisciplinary anthropology of embodiment is a conversation partner that can help theologians recover their own traditions. And therefore, I will now speak about the interdisciplinary anthropology of embodiment. And I guess the next speaker in your series, Thomas Fuchs, will much more say about this point. In 1993, the neurobiologist Ansel Varela and the philosopher Evan Thompson have published a book with the title The Embodied Mind. Picking up ideas from the American pragmatism and the French phenomenology and insights from neurobiology, they established a new philosophy, the philosophy of embodiment. The interdisciplinary philosophy of embodiment is fundamentally committed to the view that the mind cannot be separated from the body, but must be understood as a mode of being in the world in a bodily way. The human mind does not only depend on the body, it is even constituted and shaped by bodily activities. The human mind is not the internal space of the human person, but it develops in actively engaging the environment. As embodied, the mind is always already embedded in the environment. The word embodiment could give rise to a misunderstanding. It could be taken to mean that something that is primarily disembodied is embodied only in a second step. However, the term embodiment aims at precisely the opposite. The secondary aspect is the primary one, the human mind is always embodied. By consequence, the separation between body and mind is a secondary abstraction. As soon as human consciousness awakes, it finds itself embodied. Human persons can relate to their bodies and in reflection even define themselves in opposition to their body. Yet even the most refined operations in thought remain firmly embedded in bodily behavior. This insight is at the center of cognitive science, to be more precise, it's at the center of embodied cognitive science. The paradigm in cognitive science, which has developed in the recent years. In this area, researchers suggest that, quote, of John Hawkland, mind, is not incidentally, but intimately embodied and intimately embedded in its world. Mind is always embodied and embedded in its world. The philosophy of embodiment emphasizes that the mind is not a neural network that is tucked away in some internal space, largely separated from the world, rather the mind is to be understood as a dynamic bodily way of being in the world. The hallmark of the embodied understanding of the mind can be seen in the continuous coevolution of acting, perceiving, imaging, feeling, and thinking. This is particularly striking in early child development, but remains a basic characteristic throughout human life. Mind emerges in the living interaction between body and world. The plasticity of the human mind is reflected in the plasticity of our brain. The human brain is not only 
the most complex, but also the most adaptable origin that we know of. All our experiences, perceptions, and interactions with the environment continually modify our dual structures throughout our lives. So my Heidelberg colleague, Thomas Fuchs, in his very well uh, book, uh, Ecology of the Brain. The long period during which the human brain matures is particularly significant in this context. The brain of a neonate is just a little more than 25% in size compared to the brain of an adult. And even at age 10, it is not yet fully developed. The development of the brain depends on an environment supportive of life. And the more fine-gained structure emerges only in interaction with the environment. The brain is shaped by the environment, even in its neural structures. Yet mental life is not only embedded in the world, but even brings forth this world. We can understand cognition as a shaping of a world that is structures in meaningful ways. This opens up the perspective on the deep continuity of life and mind. Our cognitive capacity to produce a world such as according to meaning has been prepared in our evolutionary history. Based on our own awareness of this capacity, we recognize this capacity in lower organisms as well. Even Thompson writes, quote, in observing other creatures struggling to continue their existence, starting with bacteria that actively swim away from a chemical repellent, we can, through the evidence of our own experience and the Darwinian evidence of the continuity of life, view inwardness and purposiveness as proper to living being. End of quote. The philosophy of embodiment thus acknowledges the evolutionary continuity of which humanity is part, but also helps recognize the reality of mind in all levels of embodied life. The fact that mental life is embodied not only implies that mind, even on its highest reaches, remains part of the organic, but also means that the organic, even in its lowest forms, prefigures mind. The anthropology of embodiment. Theologians gain a partner in dialogue that helps them understand their own biblical traditions better and makes a case against the Cartesian paradigm for which theologians too had long fall. For this reason, the exegetical disciplines are of particular significance for the dialogue between theological anthropology and an evolutionary anthropology of embodiment articulated in the newer sciences, biology, medicine, and philosophy. I want to make this very clear. The biblical texts are a bridge to an anthropology of embodiment, also with their critique of the reductionist images of the human person that are still in operation in theology even today, including those arguing for dualism or those focusing crucially on poor self-awareness. In his foundational work, on the anthropology of the Hebrew Bible, the German Old Testament scholar Hans Walter Wolf noted already in 1973 that the Hebrew Bible consistently views the human person as embodied. The Hebrew terms that has commonly been translated as soul, nefesh, aesthetic strikes the needy person who aspires to life and is therefore living. Yet the word also highlights emotional excitability and vulnerability. The human person appears as a passive being 
as a psychosomatic unity. The term nefesh also applies to semantic element vitality, which also applies to the animal. Today, we can say the historically distant text of the Bible operate with an understanding of the human person much closer to the current research and discussion in the neurosciences, biology, medicine, and philosophy than those accounts of the human person that we customarily consider modern. Biblical traditions prove their significance in all of the strangeness by bringing the real human person into view. Therefore, my next point, the wisdom of the lived body, phenomenological explorations. In 1946, the Heidelberg physician and philosopher Victor von Weizsäcker wrote, if I now survey the medical aspect in that period of life that is mine, from 1906 to 1946, the overwhelming power of the bodily human situation is what I find most impressive. It is the dependence of the mind on the body, of the soul on instinct. Yet it's also the sagacity of this bodily condition, wisdom working with the matter, how nature comes to the aid of the spirit. It's this view on humanity that starts the separation of nature and spirit. Once we perceive the embodiment of the human mind, the wisdom of nature also comes into view. The body is not merely an object to which I will date, but as my lived body, my corporal lived body, it guides me through my world. It opens up my world for me. It opens me up towards others let me sense an atmosphere immediately and often reacts appropriately through intuition. It also enlivens my mind. One of the current leading thinkers on embodiment, the American philosopher Sean Gallagher, emphasizes that the normal and healthy subject can in large measure forget about her body and the normal routine of the day. The body takes care of itself and in doing so, it enables the subject to attend with relative ease to other practical aspects of life. To the extent that the body effaces itself, it grants the subject the freedom to think of other things. Our lift bodies will leave us of the burden of having to control all the steps of our lives consciously. Thus, I give us the freedom to invest our conscious attention in more complex matters and relations beyond everyday routines. The lift body not only opens up the world to me as it has come to be, but it always already responds to its affordances. My behavior adapts to my environment often before I have consciously made sense out of it. For example, I enter a church, fall silent, and I see that a service is being held. I approach a group of cheerful people, and with a smile, I'm immediately attuned to the jovial mood, even without having heard the joke that caused their laughter. My lift, corporeal body, unlocks the affordances of my environment in a way that is often shared and with which others resonate. The sun over the hilltops entice me to go for a walk and someone else decides spontaneously to join me. Engaging in a constant interplay of perception and movement, the lived body is reasonable in ways that are often subconscious. This is a procedure that also crowns our intelligence. The embedding of the body in a structured environment that is adapted to us 
has been established in a long process of trying and testing. This embedding is essential for us as intelligent beings. Our intelligence is not hidden away in some interior space of consciousness and thought. Rather, it is a lived intelligence of our skillful movements and our practicized activities. My corporal lived body keeps me alive, enables me to act intentionally, opens up my world to me in immediate ways, and funds my intelligence in acting and perceiving in advance of my conscious efforts. If we are realizing the competence and power of the lift body, it is advisable to develop and train a new art of living one's bodily life. Instead of wanting to manufacture everything, we rather should be open ourselves to ideas and new types of action that result from the pre-reflective intentionality of the body. We should be open to going along with the spontaneous becoming of the lived body. For Protestant theologians, such ideas and thoughts sound uncommon and new. The hostility to the body has cropped up repeatedly in the history of Christianity, has deeply unsettled our trust in the power and competence of the living body. For that reason and the following, I will show how significant biblical traditions encourage readers to take the wisdom of the lived body seriously. Before I come to my next point, one small question, is everything okay? Can you hear me and can you see the PowerPoint presentation? That's very good. It's very good, okay, that's yeah. fine. Then um, I come to the next point, C point three, the wisdom of the lived body, biblical perspectives. The idea that God speaks to persons so the individual bodies is common in the Old Testament. In Psalm 16, uh, in Psalm 16, the Lord and the kidneys can stand in for each other in admonishing the psalmist. I bless the Lord who gave me counsel. In the night also my kidneys admonish me. It is considered folly to ignore the warning that is expressed in the stitches felt in the kidneys. When my heart was embittered and I was pricked in my kidneys, I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a brute beast toward you. Since the Hebrew Bible sees the human person as a fundamentally relational being that is precisely not insulated from others but open to them, it is not surprising that the kidneys, as embodied, cognitive, as embodied conscience, react also to what important social contacts think or do. The kidneys rejoice when the lips of a friend speak what is right. People feel in their own lived bodies what is the matter with them and the variety of their relationships, including the relationship with God. The Hebrew Bible mentions the heart more often than the kidneys, this organ can also function as a conscience. As a heart is a bodily organ, so the Old Testament also regards feeling, thinking, and willing as embodied processes. They are involved in bodily activities, and the steering of the heart is a bodily perception. In lemons, the heart is flapping, quaking, is in uproar. It is trampling greatly, is withered, becomes hot like fire or soft like wax and dissolves. The Old Testament can speak in such a way about the heart because the Israelites, not differing from many modern people in this, experience what has been articulated here in a bodily way in the Shes region. Thus, Psalm 55 says, my heart is quaking is in me. At bottom, this text demonstrates that a new physiology would require 
this text demonstrates that a new physio physiology would be required that does not separate the vegetative, emotional, intentional, and cognitive dimensions, but instead understands even vegetative procedures as actions of the entire person in which the organic and the intentional aspects are always already intertwined. This is a very important point. We should not make a big distinction between physiological processes and intentional processes, but we should see that even physiological veg vegetative processes are part of my subjectivity. Based on the Hebrew Bible, we can say that when the heart is making itself felt physically, it has a say in people's life. The Hebrew Bible prompts readers to listen to the heart as they physically feel it, to let it have its say concerning their own action. Explicitly, the wisdom literature advises, quote, watch over your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The prophet Nathan gives the advice to King David to be attentive to his heart too. Go to whatever is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. The story of David sparing Saul's life shows David following what his heart says. David has it in his hands to kill Saul, yet he only cuts off a corner of the king's cloth. Afterward, David's heart struck him because he had put off a corner of Saul's cloth. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I, took, that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to raise my hand against him, for he is the Lord's anointed. Here, the heart is making itself held in its beating, and David allows himself to be so unsettled that he changes course. The ethical judgment of the heart is embodied in the physiological and emotional beating of the heart. And this is the immediate reaction to David's deed. The text does not narrate how a person reflects on his action and the calmness of insight, thus arriving at a cognitive insight into an illegitimate deed. Rather, <clears throat> we are witnessing the lift body whose action has immediate repercussions for one's vegetative emotional state, leading to a new orientation of action. Here, the ethical judgment uncovers how God wants David to act in this situation precisely as it is embodied and embedded in the situation. <clears throat> New Testament authors, likewise, are no strangers to the wisdom of giving one's lived body a say in how to live one's life. According to the Gospel of Luke, for instance, it is of particular importance to listen to the lived body. In the example narrative of the Good Samaritan, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan are all said to have seen the man who was robbed. Yet such seeing itself does not result in the hell that is necessary. The priest and the Levite see the man in misery, yet they walk past. The Samaritan, by contrast, helps the battered man, and that is because he not only saw him, but, quote, was moved with piety. In Greek, espragniste. He allows himself to be touched and affected by someone else's misery, and in being affected, he is moved, even grasped physically. The noun that is used here, spanchnon, which occurs only in the plural, denotes the inner origins. The acts of the apostles use the word in the physical sense, in describing Judah's suicide, the text says all his bowels gushed out. So the Samaritan feels the other person suffering in his own body, in his inner organs. The reason he acts in a way that the passers-by did not 
is that he allows the physical experience shape his action. In Luke, Jesus narrates this parable to illustrate the command to love your neighbor. Yet, we cannot command anyone to feel compassion, which after all is a passing event. The philosopher Gerhard Böhme solves this apparent paradox persuasively. I quote him, the commandment to love our neighbor does not summon us to have a certain effect, but rather not to drown out the natural participation in the suffering of others. <clears throat> As bodily beings, we have already been affected by the suffering of others, and the commandment of neighborly love calls on us to allow this effect-based participation in the misery of others to shape our own action. The wisdom of the lived body can even run ahead of self a very easy. And the two, the, when the two disciples recognized Jesus in Emmaus, they realized that their hearts were already burning within them when the risen Lord had interpreted the scripture for them on the way. And the risen Lord appears to the disciples in the subsequent narrative. The lived bodies of the disciples react similarly to Jesus Christ's presence in expressing joy. The gospel explicitly says that joy preceded faith e.g. preceded the understanding that Christ was risen. That's very, very interesting. They first feel joy, and therefore they cannot understand uh, that uh, really Jesus is risen. And after the physical reaction of the body, we have the, um, uh, the acknowledge of the risen Christ. Only joy overcome the disciples in such a way that their rationality was at first unable to grasp what had happened. Burning hearts and joy unbound are phenomena of ecstatic resonance. They cannot be explained by means of a stimulus response schema or in poor physiological terms, nor are they bodily procedures that are consciously controlled. As in laughter or weeping more generally, they display an autonomous behavior of the corporal lift body, but may also say an emancipation of the heart from conscious reason. Emotions reveal themselves in bodily expression even before the person who has emotions is aware of them. It is precisely the autonomous activity of the lift body that gives rise to a humane compassionate response that is appropriate both to the situation or to one's own personality. And there is I come to my last point, third sin and the destiny of humanity. Christian theology has never viewed the human person based solely on empirical human qualities but has always also discussed the destiny of human person. I think the Swedish theologian Ola Sigurdsson is right when he writes, quote, that the body is created by God is given in Christian theology, but without asking what it is created for, creation theology is incomplete. According to Luther, philosophy does not know the whole and perfect human person for of all things, it does not know the point and purpose of human life, which is to be justified by God and perfected as the image of God. According to Calvin, humans have been created to know God, e.g., to recognize what, what God desires of them. Quote, God has placed us in this world to be glorified in us. God has placed us in this world to be glorified in us. From the Reformation perspective, human persons can only be understood based on their destiny. The human person is created for glorifying God, e.g. to reflect God's good intentions for God's creation in this world, God's justice and God's love. Mm -hmm. 
the human body has been created to honor God. Yet since it is still far removed from living up to this goal, the biblical traditions locate the lived body at the intersection of life and death, good and evil. This Cain, already the first human person to be born, speaking on the literary level of the biblical canon, lives within the tension between succumbing to sin, which lurks at his door by killing his brother out of envy, and acting well, living with his head held high. In giving the Torah to Israel, God places the people within the tension of life and death. See, I've said before you today, life and good, death and evil. According to Paul, the mortal body can either be ruled by sin or be permitted by God's spirit and become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Quote, from the letter to the Romans, no longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present you, yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. <clears throat> from a biblical perspective, sin does not define the essence of the human person. Nevertheless, the biblical traditions show an increasing tendency to the portray the human person as inclined to choose evil and death. At the same time, the biblical traditions point readers towards God's liberating action. People are set free from obedience to sin and made to serve justice. I quote once more Sigurdsson, the theology of the body <clears throat> can therefore not content itself with describing the transcendental structure of human embodiment, but must also clarify the fact that the body is embedded in an essential drama of salvation. According to the American philosopher von Welten, this particular perception of the lived human body is a crucial contribution the biblical traditions make to an appropriate understanding of the human lived body. They quote, they place the body at the intersection of good and evil, life and death, addressing issues that we are only beginning to formulate. They thus pose the question of the destiny and the future of human bodily life. Belton rightly notes that the New Testament does not argue for rejection of the body, but for its redemption and its transformation into a site of moral and spiritual disclosure. The lived body is destined to become the locus of God's revelation the temple of the Holy Spirit, which helps the environment to experience God's good intentions for his creation more concretely. However, people can also fall, uh, people can also fall short of this destiny. De facto, they fall short again and again. Instead of taking guidance from God's good intentions for creation, Conveying God's justice, love, and kindness towards other people, and thereby growing more deeply into the image of God, people invest their life energy into a supposed enhancement of their lives at the cost of others. People are enthralled to what they discern as a seeming law of life and biological life by the violent struggle to assert one's own interests and the interests of one's own group. The characterization of kind by the Old Testament scholar Frank Kuzeman applies to this type of person as well. Quote, he determines on his own what is good for him and what appears good to him, he establishes, if necessary, his violence. End of quote. The Christian faith makes a crucial distinction. Also, all people live according to the flesh, for as Paul also puts it, 
there's no one who's righteous, not even one. The fact that the human person comes under the power of sin is not part of the human condition. By nature, the human person is finite, vulnerable, and limited in perceiving the world. But by nature, the human person is not a sinner. This insight discloses itself to the Christian faith in the life of Jesus Christ, who shared our bodily, fleshly condition without coming under the spell of sin. In Christ's life, which was bodily but was not shaped by sin, the seemingly inseparable connection between flesh and sin turned out to be an illusion. People can live a life in the flesh that is consistent with God's good intentions or creation. For this reason, Christian faith understands human destiny in Christ. People are destined to take part in God's fight against sin by communicating faith, hope, and love the way Jesus Christ does. They are meant to let the spirit of Jesus Christ shape their bodily actions and become a Zoma Pneumaticon, a spiritual body. As embodied images of God, it is the purpose of humans to reflect God's gracious contentions in their bodily behavior towards other, to enact what life is mean to be like, and to create new possibilities that promote life. This way, they contribute to the building up and the preservation of a community that communicates faith, hope, and love. We get a more nuanced view on this community if we contrast the perspectives of the Old and the New Testament on the communities God wants to build up. The Old Testament consistently envisions a political order shaped by justice, mercy, and knowledge of God. Quote, he has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. But as for you, return to your God, hold fast to love and justice and wait continually for your God. The demands of justice, mercy, and knowledge of God also shape the legal corpora of the Hebrew Bible. Some of the Old Testament traditions originate in times when Israel's state-like social structure was relatively independent politically, and they articulate the expectation that God would grant Israel such independence again at some point in future. New Testament traditions were shaped in a different socio-historical context. Nevertheless, they are similar to the Old Testament vision in aiming at the creation and preservation of congregations that serve as parables of the coming kingdom of God. In our times, Christian faith depends on the equal potential of both testaments to provide practical guidance. Congregations shaped by faith, hope, and love figure prominently in the Christian faith, as does the political order governed by justice, mercy, and the search for truth. If Old Testament perspectives count for something, surely the Christian social vision must insist on the rule of law and robust social welfare provisions. Already Deuteronomy's sibling essence shows that such a state depends on people hearing the call to tend to the neighbors, not in a paternalistic way, but like brothers and sisters. By contrast, Cain's attitude, encapsulated in the question whether he is his brother's keeper, is detrimental to achievements in the rule of law and social welfare. With a view to the wider biblical canon, we can then say that human persons are designed to communicate faith, hope, and love, and to build congregations and communities shaped by these attitudes, and to contribute to the building up and preservation of social systems in which justice, mercy, and the knowledge of God The question is how the general destiny of the human person, the communication of faith, love, and hope can become a concrete reality 
in one's own biography. What ways are there to strengthen others in their trust, to help them experience love and have hope? Since the communication of faith, hope, and love are mean to gain specific shape in every life, nobody needs to do everything. The destiny of a finite person is also and always itself finite. The tasks to which one could devote oneself are so many for that people could give up hope if they had not been free to precisely, to do precisely what one perceives as one's particular task here and now. Life's destiny takes on a specific shape for each individual. The New Testament narratives of Jesus healing the ill makes it found in a profound way. By no means are all the healed people called to follow Jesus and become disciples. Jesus sends a paralytic home whom he healed, Mark 2. After exercising the unclean spirit from the Jesus saying man, Jesus keeps him from joining this group, but gives him the task to proclaim Jesus among his friends and family, Mark 5. In Mark 10, by contrast, Bartimaeus shoots his health by deciding to follow Jesus. Human destiny has a particular shape for each of these who were healed. To communicate faith, hope, and love can mean for some to be called to work in the public with, pro with proclamation and discipleship and to take on leadership roles in social systems. For others, it can mean to find their place and fulfill their function in the more intimate circle and to work among friends and family. If in this sense, we ask for the destiny of life that may change within one's biography, we will need to ask secondly, which ways are likely to strengthen my hope, my love and my faith? There's a way to practice self-effacement for the benefit of others that does not even ask this question anymore. Ultimately, this kind of activity makes people ill. This prompts the third question for the right balance. How much can any particular person give without becoming exhausted in the long run? What can he or she tolerate without breaking? This self-effacement implies always the sacrifice of vitality. It's the ultimate sacrifice of vitality is death. A person needs to find the right balance between self-effacement and vitality again and again. We can make the joyful experience that there are forms of self-effacement that are experienced as enhancing vitality. Yet nothing can simply be taken for granted here. And usually the situation is such that first of all, people need to invest, sacrifice certain opportunities for life and a measure of vitality without knowing for certain that these sacrifices will strengthen their own lives. In the process of finding a balance, the lived body has a side as well. In this sense, the theological anthropology of the body argues for greater attentiveness for one's own lived body. We can feel it in our own bodies and see in other people's bodies as well. The opportunities of life makes them ill or strengthens their vitality. It would be wise to hear out the wisdom of one's own body when discerning the destiny of one's own life. It is the destiny of the human being as embodied image of God to communicate truth, love, and hope. Since God's self vouches for this destiny, it implies a promise for bodily life. Precisely in their embodiment, human persons will become agents of faith, hope, and love, and so inherit eternal life. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kiko. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, my colleague, Professor Isa Müller, has presented very interesting reflections on the relevance of ongoing interdisciplinary studies of uh, embodiment for the theological anthropology 
I found this consideration is very stim stimulating. Starting from a traditional concept of incarnation, salvation, and especially the theological anthropology of Karl Barth, then moving on to the organizing concept of this lecture, the psychosomatic unity of human person or the wisdom of the body. This concept was presented from the viewpoint of three perspectives, interdisciplinary anthropology of embodiment, phenomenology, and Bible studies. Finally, based on this concept, Professor Ezra Miller summarized this lecture with the normative statement that the human being are destined to take part in the communities shaped by faith, hope, and love. One of the inspirations of Professor Ezra Miller's lecture was for me to think about the Confucian Christian dialogue since the middle of the 20th century, which was dominated by the traditional dualistic anthropological frameworks, especially by the moral philosophy of Immanuel Kant and the following moral theology in 19th century. Based on this background, the new Confucianism emphasizes the conflict between Confucianism and Christianity. But if we move in the context of the paradigm of embodiment, then we probably we have more possibilities to see, to discover the similarities in both traditions, in particular, the similar understanding of heart, kidney, lived body, and perhaps the cosmological dimension of justice. I appreciate very much your reflections on the wisdom of the lived body. I would be very keen to know how will you arrange topics like pain of body and disability of body in the paradigm of embodiment? That is my question. Thank you very much for this kind response. And uh, interesting that you see bridges to combine Confucian and Christian views. And I very um, excited to see how this will develop in the recent years in uh, Chinese theology. But uh, now you have asked the question for the vulnerability of the body. It's not that I say the body is the solution of all problems. Even we have and we feel it at our own lived body, uh, the vulnerability um, of the body, the finitude of the body. And uh, even in this, uh, if I want, and I want to make first the point, even in this, we can see the wisdom of the body. Even the ill body can have a message that something was not right in our life. Or Paul puts it in his communication with the congregation of Corinth um, that he says, okay, a lot of people are ill in your community, in your congregation. A lot of people have died. Why it is? And then he asks, this is a sign that in your congregation there uh, are things not going well. And then he says, uh, if you would celebrate the Holy Communion in another way, uh, we would not have these people who um, have died and uh, get ill. And this is very important. And now I have to add a very important point. Um, it's not that Paul says the individual people who get ill or the individual who has died. Um, was a big sinner in the community um, of Corinth because, uh, um, yeah, to put it a bit, little bit freely, the sinners are still alive. If not, uh, Paul did not have uh, to um, address them. And therefore, uh, two very important points. On the one side, um, sin is not a punishment by God, but uh, if we see sin, in the light of the wisdom of the body, if we, sorry, if we see illness in the light of the wisdom of the body, we can ask whether even the ill body has its say in our own life, whether um, the ill body can detect that there's something wrong in my own existence. Thank you. Um, I see one audience, one of the audience raised their hand. Yes, there's a question in the audience about yes. aestheticism, right. of course. Uh, yes. um, first of all, you have heard that I make very strong the power of 
the body and that we should open up to the pre-reflexive intentionality of the body. But of course, uh, there is a possibility of an aesthetic life, but even an aesthetic life is an embodied life because it is a form um, which is only enabled by the body. Mm. And it is a form which um, shapes the body life in a special way. Therefore, I would not argue um, that there's a big difference between the suggestion let us open up for the pre-reflexive intentionality of the body and an aesthetic lifestyle, but we have to think anew about asceticism as a kind of an embodied lifestyle. I hope um, I meet the question or, and please ask more. Yeah. I see LTS Alison Hui raise their hand, but I don't know. Can you speak? Please feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions about the content of the lecture as a very interesting lecture. Um, okay. Uh, I have my second question. If you, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have the question, I have my second question. Uh, actually, it's very, uh, I think it's very uh, particular question about the good Samaritan. My second question relates to the example of the good Samaritan you mentioned in this lecture. The Good Samaritan as a center figure in the current discussion about altruism. In your opinion, he listens to the lived body. That means allows himself to be affected by the mystery of others. He uses his empathetic ability in helping others. In his critic of judgment, Immanuel Kant, as you know, called his empathy as sensus communis, common sense, which based on our imagination, with sensus communis or more imagination, I can put myself in the position of the others. But Kant didn't say that this ability has to do with our lived body. Can we say, if we follow your argument, that our imagination must necessarily be anchored in the body? And how? That would be my question. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a very important uh, question. Um, my argument was not that we all have a common opinion that we all have a natural moral obligation to help others. But we are, as embodied beings, beings that are embedded in relational structures. And before thinking about relations, before asking the question, what should I do? Before thinking about what morality is, we are shaped by the bodily lived lives of the others. Before, for example, if you come into, well, before you entry into a room and then you see a lot of people, your body is, is already still communicating with the others on a bodily way and then I reflect, oh, uh, this is a person I met uh, 20 years ago in tubing, and this is a person, and oh, uh, here I want to do this and this. And therefore, this is a very uh, important point. Before thinking about our relationships to others, we are in a bodily way affected by the others. And this is only the point I want to make, and this means ethically, if we want to open us up for the pre-reflexive intentionality of the body, we have to shape this being affected bodily by the others, our own uh, working, mm -hmm. our own actions. And therefore it is really a difference to say uh, we have a moral communal opinion to help others, or to see, no, our starting point is not our moral obligation, but the starting point is our 
being bodily affected by the other. Yeah. Make it sense or yeah, I think, so. to... I think so. The reason why I raised this question because uh, the census commoners or the common sense, uh, as you know, the, the writings of Hannah Arendt uh, mm -hmm. in his 60s, um, I think is uh, <clears throat> philosophy or, or her uh, political philosophy or is doctrine of sociality of the personhood has something to do with this uh, counting uh, um, census commoners. Uh, but I think from your paradigm of embodiment, we perhaps we can have uh, another type, another part, another uh, kind of uh, another kind of uh, uh, doctrine of sociality of the personhood, uh, okay. namely from the body. This is different from this uh, reading of Hannah Arendt on uh, Kant's doctrine about the consensus commoners. So that's the reason why I raised this question. Okay. So um, uh, thank you very much. This makes uh, sense even for yeah. me. And this is a very important point. Um, the basis of our sociality is, is embodied via not, yeah. only, not only the mind is embodied yeah. in my own body, but with my body, I'm embedded in, right. in this world and in our being together. And therefore, I'm always uh, be affected by other people. And now it is a question what we want to make with this insight. But I guess this is a very essential level on which on all um, human sociality is built up. Thank you. Um, okay. Is there any questions from our audience? Yes, there is uh, one. I see. One. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's very good. Yes, there's a question, can you explain the relevance or insight if any of your views concerning environment for sociological perspectives on artificial intelligence? And first of all, I would say, before we should think about how we can enhance our human intelligence, we have to see what a wonderful, and well-working model our intelligence is. And therefore, I, I, at the first point, I don't see the problem that we have enhanced our intelligi uh, intelligence. But first of all, I would like to show and to demonstrate how in, in such a wonderful way, our intelligence is uh, always, always still working. And then, um, if I think about something about um, enhancement of intelligence, I would not say we need something totally different, but I would ask um, what can we learn from our nature, from our lived body to enhance intelligence? This would, in my sense, be the right question. And Yes, uh, now we have a, a question about the function of the spirit in our body and uh, Jesus' uh, body. Um, it's interesting, uh, now I can call a very famous German, um, Wolfgang uh, Goethe. And Goethe um, was arguing um, that in nature, the origin teach the animal what to do but the human people can also teach their audience. And I guess this is totally true. Our behavior is um, shaped by our traditions, by our views, um, world views, uh, by our religion. And in this sense, I would say um, the spirit of God is a possibility to let shape my own even bodily actions by another spirit, by a spirit which is not known in this world, it's a new spirit, and the new spirit can shape our action in a new way. So that, that really something new can emerge. And you see it very clear in Jesus Christ. We have a live, we have a life, live in a bodily way, which is not shaped by the sin. And um, we are very sorry that, you, that we do not see it in the same clarity, but only um, confessing our sins that we do not see it in the same way in our own lives. And I guess this is very important. Yeah, we can teach our audience, we can 
let our bodily actions shape by traditions and even by the living spirit of God. And this is uh, God's aim for the human body. He should be a temple of the Holy Spirit and thereby communicate faith, love, and hope to other people. So that was a question, spirit in our body. Oops. And now, Yes, uh, it is a question about the relationship between self-effacement and fatality. I guess this is a very important uh, point. Thank you very much that you uh, asked once more uh, for this. Um, if we look once more on the Good Samaritan, yeah, he wants to make his way and now he is affected by other and therefore he changed his way. He, you can say, um, what you see here is a self-effacement for the benefit of the people, of the person who was robbed. And this self-effacement means that the Good Samaritan leaves his own way. Yeah, it is a sacrifice of um, what the Good Samaritan wants to do. And now it's very uh, important um, that such a self-effacement always implies a sacrifice of vitality that you can uh, always read uh, by Immanuel Kant. And we have some forms of self-effacement which not only ask the question anymore whether the self-effacement for the benefit of others burdens these people is too heavy for these people. Uh, and for example, um, it's a really interesting um, story of Jesus, the good Samaritan, as he does not offer his whole life to say, all time of my life, now I want only to work for this person who was robbed. But he says, okay, I invest time and I invest money. And this is money I bring him to a hospital or a guest house. Uh, Yes, and then the person there should work for the people. And therefore, the Good Samaritan is affected by the other. He lets this being affected by the others shaping his own action, but he don't give up all his own aspirations, all his own ideas, what he wants to do in his life. And therefore, I would say this is a very good example for the balance between self-effacement and uh, following uh, the own uh, interests. And we have always to ask um, for a good relationship between we have a lot of people uh, who are trained by Christian uh, schools and traditions, um, self-effacement, 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 um, but they're not teach to ask the question, what is, what helps me? What strengthens my faith, my love, and my hope. I hope uh, this is clear because there are other questions. Um, what's the implication of this view of a much human being on the relationship between nature and grace? Um, yeah, this is an interesting question, and you have heard I uh, rely on the theology of Calvart, and then you ask, hey, Calvart make a big distinction between nature and Christ. How could you say that we should open up to the uh, pre-reflexive intentionality uh, of the body? But I guess uh, if you read that more clearly, you can really say um, in the light of the grace, we see even in the nature of man, that the man is not a sinner, but has really a heart open up to his uh, fellows, that he is not a solitary man, but a man in relationship. And this, I would say, uh, makes sense. Uh, my way is not from nature to grace. From, excuse me. My way is not from nature to grace, but to see nature in the light of grace in a new way. Thank you. Uh, how can we? Uh, 
understand individuals lack of repentance or lack of feeling of guilt agreed on its wrongdoings in relation to the wisdoms of the body? Yes, of course. It is the same um, like, again, in the story of the a good Samaritan, there's only one who let his action shaped by the being affected of others. And it's the same that not all people let shape what they think about themselves that shaped their conscience by that what they felt, what they feel in a bodily way. Yeah? There's no automatism. I don't say because we are all related, um, we are all people who want uh, to um, build up relational social structures. And I don't say because we feel our guilt in a bodily way, we are all people who confess our guilt, and we all, all know, even looking on ourselves, uh, that there's no automatism. Now, we are, as human beings with a special evolutionary history, always in the danger to orientate our own life in what we see in biological nature. Um, um, Kampf um Starsein, um, like David said, um, the struggle for life, yeah? And therefore, in this struggle of life, we think, oh, it's better not to confess my sin. It's better not to show that I'm affected by another, yeah? But I would say we are affected by others. We feel our guilt uh, in a bodily way, but this does not mean an automatically way is that we confess it or that we act according to what we feel in the bodily way. And um, because we think in our world, it is much more better and I have much more um, advantage for myself if I don't confess myself and if I don't be too much affected by others. So, um, is there any questions or? Okay, our time is up. I would like to thank each of you to being here and all your good questions. And I would like to thank Professor Ezra Miller for this wonderful lecture. And our second and third lectures by Professor Thomas Fox and Professor Leiping shall so take place on November 18th and 26th. Come and join us. If you are interested, please register with the Institute of Sino Christian Studies. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. It was a pleasure for me to be here. I wish you all the best and God's blessing for your institute. And I hope we can meet one day um, personally, face to face in Hong Kong or maybe in Germany again. Thank you very much, and uh, I wish you all the best for your lecture series. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, and auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>